Well, hello and good morning to everybody. Today we have Walter Wittich and we are going to be talking to him about a lot of things that he works with and especially dual sensory impairment. Welcome, Walter. Hi there. Thank you, Marlene, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad to have you. Um, but tell me a little bit about yourself. I know about you, but tell the audience about you. Uh, so I am originally from Germany. I came to North America in 98, uh, but for a completely different reason. Uh, I had a life before all of this. I was actually a professional ballet dancer. And so I came to North America dancing until I was 30, had a good solid career, got to see the world, got to do all sorts of wonderful things. And then decided, all right, then there must be more, there must be other things. And so when I retired from dancing, I went back to school and decided, all right, university, sounds cool. What's that all about? And decided to do an undergraduate degree and then I did a master's degree and then I did a PhD and then I did a postdoctoral fellowship. And here we are doing the things that we do. So uh, that is actually how I uh, discovered low vision as a topic during this adventure as well, because it was during my undergrad that we had to do sort of a little project, you know, did a research project. So I was looking around in our faculty at Concordia University in Montreal and I wasn't quite sure what to do. I didn't really have any focus on all of this, but I did have a very cool professor who had a fierce sense of humor. And so I decided to approach her and say, you know, I have to do a research project. I'd really like to work with you. We sort of have a similar sense of humor. And uh, that is how I met Olga Overberg. And so for those people out there who know who that is, this is one of the, you know, the Canadian pioneers in, in low vision rehabilitation research. And that was how I introduced, well, that's introduced to this topic. It changed my life. That's awesome. It's funny where we end up when we just allow ourselves the opportunity to look into something um, and accept something that someone you know offers you or something it's really can change your life forever <laughs> I think it's quite fascinating that to me very much life is about the people in it it is these people that change the direction of where you suddenly go that give you a new idea it just doesn't have to be all professional, right? You fall in love, you, you have a neighbor who changes, gives you a new idea that changes your interests. So as long as these other people are part of our lives, I think this, this was all meant to be going very mm -hmm. well. And as long as we're open to accepting and looking into that stuff, because it's so important. Yeah, it's very, very important. Um, so, so that's kind of what led you into the, the low vision field. Now, was that also what led you into the dual sensory impairment or was it kind of all together? Well, this kind of went in steps. Uh, at the beginning, uh, my very first experience with this whole low vision thing uh, was that I got to observe an intake in the low vision clinic because that's also where Olga's lab was placed. And so she said, why don't you sit in, see what they do, get an idea of what this is all about. This is you know, 20 years ago, and I still remember this like this was yesterday. Uh, this was a 96 year old lady with macular degeneration. She was in there with both her daughters that were both in their seventies. She was getting a classic traditional assessment of her vision of all sorts of levels of visual function and functional vision. And then something fascinating happened. I was initially focused on the patient or the client, but then at some point I kind of, looked around and I started observing these two daughters. And so while acuity was being measured, one of the daughters was counting all the letters that mom got right. And you could see how she was really excited about what mom was able to do. And the other daughter literally counted all the mistakes. And so you, you could see these dynamics of this family unfolding in front of you. And you could just imagine what goes on at home. And I was thinking, how does this work? How does this mother and her daughters negotiate this impairment? And, and so I initially was simply fascinated by the complexity of this picture. 
And so then what I ended up doing during my master's and my PhD was very much focused on how we diagnose and measure and evaluate visual function. And then eventually I got more interested in functional vision, what people actually can do with all of this. And uh, I decided to do my PhD project on people that have peripheral visual field loss. And because I was in a department at McGill of neuroscience, there was a question about what goes on in the brain. You know, can we uh, talk about cortical plasticity in this context? And so uh, through my recruitment of people with peripheral vision loss, I ended up having to exclude a lot of participants with Usher syndrome because of communication barriers. Uh, I had never learned sign language at this point. Uh, I didn't really know what's going on with this whole hearing thing. And so after my PhD, or so towards the end of my PhD, I realized life is complicated. People don't just have one thing, whether that is hearing or arthritis or respiratory problems, vision impairment rarely appears alone. So what do we do when it becomes complicated? So I decided to do my postdoctoral fellowship in audiology with an audiologist researcher who was very interested in similar questions that I was asking in vision, he was asking in hearing. I decided, let's look at this dual sensory thing. So that's kind of how that started. And at the beginning, I was very much focused on older adults still with acquired hearing loss, acquired vision loss, but that's you know, now a good 10 years ago. And so since then, my inclusion has become larger and larger and more complicated and more complicated. And uh, I'm getting more interested and more fascinated when things get complex. Yeah, there's a lot out there about that. I mean, it's just, I mean, yeah, we, we don't know. We're all trained in low vision. And although we're you know, the occupational therapists, and, and we're, we, you know, it's funny when you learn in school, um, they all, oh, the patient who has a hip fracture, this is what you do. And they don't say the patient who has a hip fracture and arthritis and can't see and can't do this. Yeah, they never look at, it doesn't, I don't feel like sometimes they look at the whole picture all the time. So yeah, that's a, a great, great thing to remind us of. Yeah. I actually find occupational therapists have a really interesting pathway because you're being trained as generalists. And so the advantage of the generalist is that you have this possibility of a broad view. Now, I am training low vision and blind rehab therapists, right? So the view is much more narrow, but it often has more depth. And so it is like a blanket. You pull a little bit here, it's short on the other end. The more generalized your view, the less depth you have in any of them. And the more you go into depth, you don't have the space for this generalized view anymore. And of course, ideally, we all get to work together and then cover everything in all the necessary depth. So that's, I think, also a big argument for all of us to collaborate uh, on, on our care for our patients. Yeah, and get out of what they call the silos sometimes where we're all in one little um, concentrated area and we don't look outside of that. And I know for my mentor, Kathy Holden, she was always saying that, you know, you got to get out of silos and everybody's got to kind of work and overlap so mm -hmm. that we can help people the best possible. Yes. Okay, um, so what do you, uh, tell me about the work that you're doing with um, the dual sensory with patients who have dual sensory, sensory issues? Uh, because most of my research is really based at our local rehab centers, many of the questions that we investigate are actually questions that come from the clinic to us. Uh, in Canada, there's a strong culture of what we call integrated knowledge translation. And so what we try to do is find ways in each project where there is a constant exchange between the needs of the clinic and uh, the, the possibilities that we have in the academic system to answer these questions. Uh, we bring questions often to the clinic to see whether that is actually of any interest for them. You know, uh, uh, some of us in the academic ivory tower have solutions to problems that we didn't even have. And so this, uh, this exchange goes on in our lab all the time. 
Uh, one of the big topics around which we work right now has to do with the usability of assistive devices. Um, in traditional design and engineering, as well as in some of the traditional clinical service delivery, you will tr treat one impairment at a time. And so you have devices that are designed for vision loss that may talk to you, for example. You have devices that are designed in hearing loss that give you visual displays. And of course, they work beautifully when you're only considering that, that there is one impairment. I find this really stunning to see what happens when multiple impairments come together. And suddenly you're trying to use a hearing device, but you can't see it. Now, what do you do? Do you have enough tactile capacity? What is the role of the haptic you know, in there? This is still very underdeveloped. There is not a lot of work done on haptic interfaces. And uh, this doesn't necessarily have to be braille and tactile information. Sometimes it may just be that a smartphone that has no buttons on it because everything is on a tactile screen may not work for everyone on everything. If there is some neuropathy going on, God knows what the complexity can be. So I find uh, device accessibility in multiple impairment very, very fascinating. Um, that's interesting because it brings me to our next question that I actually had somebody um, was posting on a Facebook page that I'm a part of and they have a patient who has dual sensory impairment and they don't even know. They're like, where do I look? What's the best, um, you know, where do I get information? Where's the best place to get resources for someone who has a dual impairment? So uh, I will tell you a mini anecdote about something that happened to me when I started out studying dual sensory loss. Uh, and it was a really bizarre barrier. I was trying to find the literature, right? I was trying to figure out, there must be stuff out there. What do I look for? And so I'm looking for dual sensory this and combined vision impairment that. And I'm going, this doesn't look right. There is so little out there. This cannot be, right? This cannot be that nobody has looked into these things. And so I started talking with some of the clinicians in our world and a couple of other people that had worked in this before. And they said, oh, well, Walter, you're, you've missed your number one key term that you need to be looking for, which is deafblind. And I'm going, yeah, but these older adults are not deafblind, right? They have some residual vision, they have some residual hearing. The last thing they do is consider themselves deafblind, right? If, <laughs> if I come along and say, oh, well, I see that you've got some acquired deafblindness, they're going to tell me where I should go. <laughs> and so it turns out that the first thing that I needed to adjust is how we all communicate with each other. It turns out that when you look into the rehabilitation community, Many of the rehab programs are actually called deafblind rehabilitation programs, but they cover the entire spectrum from the traditional kid that is born with deafblind, sort of the traditional idea of the Helen Keller case, all the way through people with Usher syndrome who have one or the other impairment arrive later on. They may or may not be using sign language. They may have had enough hearing to be oral in their communication, all the way to older adults that have acquired impairments in their 70s and 80s. And so then I realized as researchers, we are a bit more hesitant to use the word deafblind because we think deaf and blind, but the clinicians don't. So there is some vocabulary that needs to be and terminology we needed to play with. So when you have people out there that are looking to access services and information, my advice now is actually reach out to your local deaf blind rehab center, uh, whether this has Helen Keller in the name or something else that sounds this way, because your perception may be that they only deal with deaf blind children. That is not the case. Uh, their service offer is likely going to go across the age span and whether it is congenital or acquired may not matter to them. And even if they don't require to provide these kind of services themselves, they will know who does because they will be plugged into that kind of world. So, you know, we, we face a similar problem that we face in low vision rehab. A lot of people with low vision don't consider themselves blind. So why would they ever go to 
the state commission for the ta -ta -ra, blind. The B word is suddenly a barrier to access, especially for older adults that don't have that as part of their identity. Yeah. With deaf blindness, you have exactly the same problem. You've got people with dual sensory loss that is partial, right? They have some residual hearing, some residual vision. They can be beautifully rehabilitated with all the techniques that we know. And you may throw in a little bit of a tactile and haptic here and there, but basically they're not deaf blind, but they're served within the deaf blind community. Okay. And let, can you define what you're meaning by haptic? All right. So uh, there are many, many different ways of how we could provide information that is neither visual nor auditory. Uh, I'm going to start you out with something simple. You will remember in yonder olden days, telephones still had buttons on them. Yep. So what we do, for example, now is that many of these accessible telephones for hearing, uh, hearing impairment, for example, will have an amplification button so you can crank up the volume a little bit more. But the buttons themselves are still, so these half round things that you can feel. And if you know that on the top left is the one, even if you can't see it, you will be able to feel it. Mm -hmm. You may also have the letter one that is raised a little bit. You may not be able to read braille, you don't need to, but if there's a form for that number one on the button, you may still be able to just confirm that you are in the right place. place. And so there's some tactile information. Okay. Now, uh, you could also have a smartphone, for example, where you have an alarm on it, and that smartphone will start vibrating for you in your pocket instead of making a noise or starting to blink. But when it starts moving, here is some haptic information. Right, so these are anything that require your sense of touch to some shape or form, and they will still support or replace whatever other visual or auditory information you may get. Okay, thank you for defining that. So I know that you, you work at Concordia University in Montreal? Uh, yeah, so I've, that's a good question because my life has many layers and it's uh, sometimes a bit confusing. So my main uh, appointment is at the School of Optometry at the University of Montreal. Uh, but because I always want to have my fingers in other people's pies, I have an adjunct appointment at Concordia in Psychology and that facilitates a lot of the psychosocial work that I do. I also have an adjunct appointment in occupational therapy at Miguel that links me with a lot of my collaborators over there where you're looking at it for occupational performance and that kind of you know, the, the hands-on work. And uh, then the other affiliation that I have in here is uh, my role as the research network director for DeafBlind International. And so that gives me a context where I can reach out and represent, you know, the, uh, uh, it's around 200 researchers and people with research interests around the world. We've got more or less representation from all continents uh, at different levels of need, you know, in terms of research and rehabilitation for deaf blindness. That's awesome. And I know you do offer some programs for occupational therapists if they want to specialize in low vision, is that correct? So what we're doing, what we've done in the last couple of years, and again, that brings me back to some of the efforts of Olga Overbury. Olga has basically built a master's program for us at the school uh, where you can do a master's in vision science with a specialty in vision rehabilitation and vision impairment. Uh, the beauty about the program is that it's available in both English and French, so you can do this in either language. Uh, now, for this master's degree itself, we would expect that people have an undergraduate degree that is somehow related to one of the health fields. Uh, but of course, many other professions like nursing, OT, PT, some other allied health professionals already have a master's in their own field but now I want to add low vision to this profile. And so what we're building right now, and I think it might be ready next year, is a diploma that is much smaller, that is specifically designed for people that have a master's in an allied health profession. But this smaller diploma, and I think it's going to be 30 credits, is then specifically designed to add low vision to your arsenal. 
Or you, what you could do also, you could do this in blind rehab in terms of uh, braille, text-to-speech, you know, the, the technologies and techniques that are more about site substitution versus site enhancement. So both of these will be available. And that's available in parable to our masters in orientation and mobility. Um, however, to, the, the diploma in O&M is a little bit larger because there are some of the fundamental courses that wouldn't have been covered in a vision impairment program. So the, the diploma in O&M is a little bit bigger. Yeah, I imagine, because I know, I don't think anybody but o and really want to train people to travel because it's just so, such a, a specialized field. It's, and a, it's a complex thing. And, you know, in the Canadian context, when we do our interviews, it's often quite funny because, you know, oh, yes, I want to be outdoors. Well, you also have to be outdoors in February when it's minus 25. And in August, when it's plus 25, and then you add humidity or wind chill. Uh, and that's not for everybody. That's, uh, it's a specific kind of profession. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and I respect it all because it's a very difficult profession. Um, so what are you researching right now? In the spirit of things that are complicated or interesting, uh, I joined a really, really amazing team a couple of years ago. There is something called the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging. And this is basically Canada's answer to uh, our national dementia strategy. So we are the research arm of uh, getting Canada ready for the topic of dementia. It's a population health uh, priority, simply linked to aging and to the way our society is unfolding over time. And it's a team of over 350 researchers across the country and we're funded uh, as one big uh, event, so to speak, and we're divided into seven, uh, no, I think it's 20 teams. And each team has a different priority. Uh, my colleague Natalie Phillips and I co-lead Team 17, which is the sensory cognitive team. And so we're leading a group of 10 researchers in our team that address various topics of sensory cognitive aging. So for example, uh, if you have an older adult that um, has some vision loss, some hearing loss, but may also have some early cognitive impairments, uh, how do you assess cognition in a person who may not see the text or may not properly hear your instructions. How do you do this? So you may have heard about the blind mocha that we developed a couple of years ago. So what, how do you score the mocha if you don't do the visual items with somebody who is blind? There's also a similar version where the mocha is actually presented on PowerPoint slides and with written instructions if people have uh, severe hearing impairment, they can read this. We're currently working on a deafblind version of the MOCA where we can find instructions on how to adjust the administration without adjusting the scoring. You know, so you can still uh, use the entire thing, but you may have to address X, Y, and Z in order to be able to best present and instruct people on the MOCA. So one part of Team 17 is the accessibility of neurocognitive neurocognitive uh, assessment in the presence of sensory loss. But we also have people on the team that have access to large databases, the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, the InterI data set, which is a global data set about home care and long-term care assessments. And all of these assessments have measures of vision and hearing, but they also have measures of cognition. And so we have, for example, we are building models right now of which kind of individual characteristics are the best predictor of changes in cognition over periods of five, 10, and 20 years. Uh, and something that I'm working on right now that is sort of the central piece of my lab, specifically before COVID hit, is what is the effect of vision rehabilitation on cognition? Uh, because we do a lot of interventions for reading, for example, that's a big part of our work. If I can reestablish the ability for you to read, does that actually have a cognitive side benefit that we don't usually measure? Because we're just measuring whether you can read again, but what does that do to your brain? So we have uh, developed a, a big protocol that considers vision, hearing, cognition, and many of the interventions that we provide in order to assess whether you actually have cognitive outcomes. 
hang on there. We are not quite as far as we wanted because COVID kind of threw a wrench in the machine. Uh, so this is a bit partially suspended right now, but uh, once vaccinations have taken us where they're supposed to take us, we'll see where we go. Yeah, yeah, that's exciting work. I mean, it's a lot that you're doing and um, it's a lot that needs to be done. I know there's been a lot of talk since COVID started with people who are lip readers with these masks on. And also when you're hard of hearing and it muffles the, the sound, I know that's been a big issue for people who are here. So we were collaborating in, in Ontario with a team of industrial researchers that are developing uh, clear plastics that don't fog up. Uh, and that also uh, will facilitate uh, speech comprehension uh, this, there's a lot of work to be done because we've also had some really interesting media exposure lately to delays in speech development in children uh, that are in an environment right now where they don't see the mouth of their care providers in long in uh, childcare, <laughs> and so suddenly the children are not speaking when they're supposed to be uh, at that age, and that's a problem. And so these care workers now wear clear masks in order to encourage and, and provide this exposure for the children. The, there are some short-term and long-term effects of the pandemic that are sort of hidden and not obvious if you don't look for them. Uh, something that will be very interesting this year is that in May for the Association in Research in Vision and Ophthalmology at the ARVO conference, there are going to be some really fascinating presentations and posters about delays in vision rehabilitation services and the effects of these delays due to COVID. What does this do to our clientele when they suddenly couldn't come in for six months? Uh, I can't tell you more right now because the program hasn't been released yet, but because I'm chair of the program committee, I know that these things are coming. Uh, Arvo is gonna be a very interesting conference this year because there are some really, really uh, interesting and uh, provocative pieces about COVID and low vision. Awesome. Is that available online? Are they going to have? So the Arvo conference this year has decided to uh, go online entirely. Last year, unfortunately, it was canceled. And so there were people were trying to record to do what they could with their posters. It was a little bit bumpy. But this year, uh, we figured out an excellent system where people can pre-record their materials. And because it is pre-recorded, it will be available online all summer. And so it's not just limited to the actual week. During that week, there will be presentations and recorded discussions and question and answer periods, but all of this material will then be available on their website for a longer period of time. Uh, it's gonna be worthwhile. And it's the Association of? For Research in Vision and Ophthalmology, ARVO, A-R-V-O. Okay, I've had G, okay. And Walter, what is your email address if people want to reach out to you? And... Sure. Walter.wittich at umontreal.ca. So W-A-L-T-E-R dot W-I-T-T-I-C-H at umontreal.ca. C-A. Okay. Okay. Well, it's been fascinating and great to talk to you. And um, we'll be looking forward to hearing from you. I know... Um, definitely in um, Ireland next year. Oh, that's definitely, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm very excited about that because I managed to put together two panels on deaf blindness. One is on congenital issues, one is on acquired and age related issues. And even though we've been waiting now for a long time to put this on, I, I'm kind of hurting all my speakers. So we will hopefully be still available for 2022 and it's coming your way. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Marlene. Take care.